Thank you, Paige. Um, that's a long list of titles that really, the most important one to me was given to me the first night I became a member of Mount Olive Lodge and it was brother. And that's the one that is the one that I would cherish more than anything else. Um, thank you all for being here tonight. Um, we're going to take a little road down, uh, or path down the road of history, I guess. Uh, we're going to look at the history of Mount Olive Lodge. And if I were just to read just the history, we'd be done in about 15 minutes, and you would all be asleep, and I'd wake you back up because it's always good sleeping weather in a thunderstorm. Um, but what I want to do tonight is not just talk about the, the basic history of the lodge. I want to go into tying a few things together with the community. I want to look at some things that you know, maybe even our own members have not heard before. So I've got a few tidbits here and there of some things that they probably haven't seen or probably haven't heard before. And we'll, uh, let's get started. So what is Freemasonry? Brother Brandy, you want to answer that question? It's a good question. That's why um, <laughs> so the definition from the Grand Lodge, and I'll go into more detail after we get through that, but really there is no singular definition that one Mason can say for everybody else because Masonry means something different to every person who experiences it. Um, it's, for some, it's a place to make friends and acquaintances. For some, it's a, a place to engage in introspection or to discuss philosophy. And for others, it's a place to practice charity and goodwill. Through all of these endeavors and countless others, Freemasonry seeks to unite good men of all backgrounds and make them better husbands, fathers, citizens, by encouraging and cultivating friendship, morality, and brotherly love. Um, we teach in our degrees things that relate to brotherly love, to charity, to truth, to temperance, to fortitude. These are things that we're taught when we first um, become Masons. And it takes a while to reflect on those and to make those part of your life. Masonry is not something where you just all of a sudden you're a mason and that's, that's it. It's a life change uh, and it's something that you have to practice every day. So I thought we might want to look at the Masonic family because what we're talking about is right in here with Mount Olive Lodge, but you can see all of these other branches that go up the, the Scottish right on the, the right hand side and the York right on the left hand side, the, the Shriners uh, somewhere in the middle. And uh, each of these are what are called dependent bodies. They help to form what, are, what we refer to as the family of masonry. And they all have their own particular charities that they might um, sponsor. So our Masonic Lodge, Mount Isle Lodge, we have a Masonic home for children in Oxford, North Carolina. And we also have a community called Whitestone in Greensboro, which is a retirement uh, community for uh, both Masons and their wives or Eastern Star members, and for also for other uh, uh, people that might be able to get in there as well. Um, if you look at the Scottish Rite, we have a program called Right Care, which uh, it is focused on uh, dealing with uh, language disorders and with dyslexia, and we work with um, the schools to identify uh, students that are having those types of challenges. We have a clinic in, at ECU. There's also one in Asheville, and uh, there's one other one in the, in the state that I'm, I'm it's slipping my memory at the time. But uh, these work with these uh, children uh, free of charge. The Shriners, you may be familiar with, with them. They have the uh, Shriners Hospitals for, uh, for crippled children for, for the Shrine Burn Centers. Um, and they raise, what is it, about a billion dollars a day, or maybe even more than that, uh, just to support those hospitals. And then the York Rite, they have their charities as well. I believe that there's one there that deals with uh, eye care and with um, some of the things that are related to that. We also have some 
uh, organizations that are meant for the the women in our families, um, Eastern Star, and uh, that is a, a co-ed organization for uh, wives and for Masons uh, to, to join the prison. Together, we have uh, youth organizations, DLA for boys, and then the Rainbow and uh, Joe's Daughters for, for girls. So there's lots of different things that relate to masonry the outside of Joe's the Masonic Lodge. Um, now, Mount Olive Lodge. December 7, 1858, all right, and there are question marks there because I found in the Grand Lodge Minutes of 1859 when the charter was awarded, but it is generally accepted that 1858 was our, the date that we were chartered, that is the date that's listed on our charter, and um, it was during that year that the Grand Lodge of Ancient Free and Accepted Masons in North Carolina established Mount Olive Lodge. Um, Joel Lawton served as the master of the lodge for the first two years. And then during the Civil War period from 1861 to 1865, we have our first quiet period. Uh, there was no uh, records yet founding, that, that haven't been found yet, uh, providing any evidence of lodge activity during that time. And then you'll see uh, below that there, from 1866 to 1880, you have a list of the um, brothers who served as master of the lodge, and you may see a few familiar names there. Not only do you see Joel Lofton, who was one of the founders of the town of Mount Olive, I do believe. Um, you also see Joseph Oliver and Franklin, or Frank English. Um, I believe there was a place where uh, Ribeyes is now that was called English and Oliver. Um, and then we had J.C. Eason, R.C. Broadhurst, and O.W. Sutton. Um, after that time period, well, here is, uh, these are from the proceedings of the Grand Lodge, and I'll show the, the actual source uh, information later on, but uh, the Grand Lodge has taken the published proceedings of their Grand Lodge meetings from early in the 1800s, maybe even into the late 1700s, and they have coordinated with uh, the UNC Chapel Hill and with a couple of other programs to scan those and have them digitally archived. And this is from the 1859 uh, proceedings. It says that Mount Olive Lodge, we've examined the work and proceedings of the lodge and find it very good. We recommend that their bylaws be approved and that a charter be granted. And it lists the names of the people who uh, were a part of that committee for that recommendation. And then you also have listed at that time, Brother Benjamin F. Cobb of Mount Olive Lodge Number 208 obtained leave of absence. He was, for that 1859 Grand Lodge meeting, the Grand Lodge meeting where our charter was approved and awarded, he was the sole representative for Mount Olive Lodge. Uh, we'll come back to him later on in our discussion, but uh, it is odd to, to think that the master of the lodge was not present at Grand Lodge to receive the charter. Well, the thing you have to understand is that Grand Lodge meetings during that time were held in the summer. What was this community known for? We were farmers, um, and the people that were listed on that charter, they had to be here because Grand Lodge at that time would last four or five days. And you didn't have a car that you could just jump in and drive to Raleigh. You might have, you might be lucky enough to be able to get a train, um, but but more than likely they they took a horse or buggy. And uh, so Dr. Benjamin Cobb, being a medical doctor, he could afford to miss a few days and have somebody just say, "Well, don't anybody get sick and nobody die while I'm gone." Um, So from 1880 to 1884, there are no reports that were sent to the Grand Lodge, and the charter was surrendered in 1884. This began the second uh, dark period in our history. Um, but on April 18, 1903, the Grand Lodge was restored, and the charter of Mount Olive Lodge was restored. Um, on 
October 3rd, 1903, new officers were installed, and that was uh, W. Frank English, W.C. Steele, and J. Henry Carr as your Master of Senior and Junior Wardens. And for those of you who are, may not be familiar with what the terms Senior and Junior Warden or Master are, you can basically attribute it as the, as the President, First Vice President, and Second Vice President of the organization. So why do we have that dark period? Really don't know. Um, in the communication dated June 10th, 1903, we find a clue, and I'm going to read that to you here. This is really the only real clue that I have as to what might have been going on in this area at that time that could cause masonry to kind of back away from being popular. It's a communication from Belmont Lodge, number 108, was read and the order spread upon the minutes in the Grand Lodge proceedings. It says, face in North Carolina, January 10th, 1903, Belmont Lodge, number 108, AF and AM, sends greetings to the Grand Lodge of North Carolina and takes pleasure in reporting Lodge in good working order with a bright outlook for the future. The increase in membership during the past Masonic year is 27 from all sources. During the past year, the Lodge expended nearly $200 in improving and furnishing Lodge room and now has one of the best equipped lodges lodge rooms to be found in a small town. The Masonic fraternity has materially grown in popular favor in this community during the past year, and today about all the prejudice engendered through ignorance seems to have disappeared. That's the clue. Wishing the brethren throughout the state a prosperous year, I am, with much respect, yours fraternally, Thomas Perrin, Secretary. So, all I can infer, and I have no real solid proof as of yet, is that there was some sort of movement against masonry in this area during that time. Um, there have been anti-Masonic movements in other areas in the past. Um, there was a little bit of trivia. You may not know that the first national political convention was not the Republican convention or the Democratic convention or even the Whigs or the Tories or any of those. It was the anti-Masonic convention. Um, at that particular time, most of the major political figures were members of a lodge. And uh, some people thought that there might be a conspiracy. Uh, still people, people still make up conspiracies today. Um, so let's move on a little bit further. Now this graph, um, just to give you a little data, starts out at their, our beginning in 1859. And you'll see that little dip down, that's the that first dark period. Um, any of you happen to know what might have been going on in 1861, 1865? There was this little conflict they called the Civil War. Uh, that's the reason why we didn't hear about anything from Mount Olive Lodge during that first little period. And then after that, you see a little spike. And then we have another period where we don't know anything about what's going on from 1881 to 1903, and then things pick back up a little bit, and they maintain around 60 members or so. And then all of a sudden, we have a jump into the 1941, I believe, is where the, we had a really big spike, but we had one earlier on. But the, this big spike where we jumped way up the top there. That happens to have coincided with people returning from World War II. Um, and what is, you'll find, and it's not just with masonry, but with many civic organizations at that time, when men would come back from war, they were looking for something to maintain that bond, that brotherhood that they had established while they were serving with each other overseas and masonry benefited from that. And we maintained and actually increased our membership for several years. And then you see it stop right around 2000 because that's about where I stopped my work in progress. Um, unfortunately, those numbers are starting to decline. And so we're starting to move back in the opposite direction. 
So what does do Masons do? Now one of the, the most uh, interesting uh, public uh, displays that we do, or the public ceremonies we do, is called a cornerstone laying. And Mount Olive has had the opportunity to experience that at three different locations from what I've been able to tell. Um, one is a graded school building in 1906, and I have the minutes from that, and I'll read it to you in just a minute. Uh, the second was Still Memorial Library. It was originally placed in 1935, but some of you may remember that we, when we moved to our current location, we had a rededication. And, uh, then at Mount Olive Lodge, when we built our current meeting location, we uh, had a cornerstone laid in 1964. So we have the graded school building, which became, after that, the original home of Mount Olive Junior College, which became Mount Olive College, which, although I cannot make myself say it, is now the University of Mount Olive. Um, if you notice, there's a little white speck up here in that northeast corner. That is the cornerstone that was placed at Mount Olive, or at the uh, greatest school building. And it, at a special communication of the Grand Lodge of North Carolina, held in the lodge room of Mount Olive Lodge, number 208 AF and AM, they were present, and this was dated April 11, 1906. Brother W.F. English, acting as Worshipful Grand Master, W.C. Steele, acting Deputy Grand Master, Max Harris, acting Senior Grand Warden, H.W. Westbrook, acting Junior Grand Warden, C.F. Sutherland, acting Junior Grand Deacon, J.H. Carr, acting Junior Grand Deacon, M.O. Summerlin, acting Grand Treasurer, B.A. Summerlin, acting Grand Secretary, Lewis Cohen, acting Senior Grand Steward, R.E. Wooten, acting Junior Grand Steward, Reverend J.T. Albritton, acting Grand Chaplain, and E.F. Hicks, acting Grand Tyler. The other brother, other brother present were W.T. Smith, J.H. Anderson, C.B. Price, and past, past master, J.C. Oberry, J.C. Edwards, F.G. Hines, M.B. Outlaw, Rodney Knowles, J.B. Oliver, past master, R.J. Sutherland, Jr., J. Royal, W.C. Steele, past master. The visiting brethren present were J.E. Peterson from Wayne Lodge 112, Lewis Cohen 112, L.C. McCullen from Falling Creek Lodge. Falling Creek Lodge was located in Grantham. Um, special communication was called for the purpose of laying the cornerstone of the greatest school building of Mount Olive. The telegram was read, read by Brother W.C. Steele from the Grand Master Winston, authorizing the officers of Mount Olive Lodge number 208 AFM in the absence of any of the officers of the Grand Lodge to perform the duties required for the occasion, whereupon the Grand Lodge was opened in form and proceeded to the building where the forms and ceremonies required by the Grand Lodge were fully complied with, and the Grand Lodge then returned to the hall of Mount Olive Lodge number 208, and Lodge was closed in form. W. English Acting Grand Master and B. Summon Acting Grand Secretary. This was included in the minutes of the Grand Lodge proceedings of 1906, and because of that project to digitize these proceedings, we're able to read that and understand what was going on at that time period. Now, most of you know that this building no longer exists. And as I was talking to Mr. Dilda some time back, I didn't know exactly what happened to the cornerstone whenever the building was torn down. We found out it wasn't really missing. It was just I didn't know all the information at the time. Uh, we really can't see it there, can we? Um, well, that is the cornerstone, and on that cornerstone there are listed six names. There are James Hatch, R. Knigge, who was the chairman, J.A. Westbrook, Dr. M. McInnes Tatum, R.J. Sutherland Jr., and M.O. Summerlin. I have through different records, through looking at different uh, years of the Grand Lodge proceedings, 
been able to determine that four of those six names were members of Mount Olive Lodge. Um, the other two, I haven't confirmed yet, but it, it wouldn't surprise me if they were members at some time as well. Um, but that is now located in the alumni crossword of the University of Mount Olive. Uh, the second uh, cornerstone or monument that we have is the one placed in the memory of Dr. W.C. Steele. He was a master mason from 1867 uh, to 1933 when he, he passed away. And a little bit of information about that uh, presentation. It was desired that uh, Mount Olive Lodge had the Grand Lodge lay the cornerstone at the dedication of the Steele Memorial Library which took place April 25th, 1935. However, just a few days before the time for the dedication, the Lodge received a communication from the Grand Secretary saying that the Grand Lodge had discontinued the practice of laying cornerstone in the building and that had already been completed. The Masonic Brethren did lay the cornerstone in an unofficial capacity. Uh, Reverend W.M. Baker of Mevin a former pastor of the Mount Olive Presbyterian Church who had served our lodge as master and in other capacities and who was a dear friend of, friend of our deceased brother, Dr. W.C. Steele, was decided upon as a logical brother to deliver the principal address and Brother Baker accepted the invitation and delivered the address and did it well. Um, so that little tidbit was something I discovered because it's not really listed in the previous or the the other histories of the lodge, it just says that we did a cornerstone laying. It doesn't say that it was not in an official capacity. Um, hopefully, the Grand Lodge is not listening to this and they'll forgive me. Now, the other uh, cornerstone, this is actually at Mount Olive Lodge. This was done in 1864. And I have a picture of that uh, cornerstone laying right up here. You're welcome to come take a look at that when we take a break. But um, most of you won't know because it's actually hidden by a bookshelf now. But uh, if you were a member of the lodge several years ago, you might have noticed that if you sat in the corner on the inside of the building, you could see the other side of that cornerstone because the cornerstone was visible on, on both sides of the wall. It went all the way through. Um, there is contents inside that cornerstone. Um, I do not have that list with me, but uh, maybe we can do that for a future presentation. So I told you to take notice of that uh, name B.F. Cobb. Um, and we talked about him being the representative that uh, was there at the Grand Lodge meeting, but who was he? because he never actually became a pastor, or became a master of the lodge. Um, and where did Joel Lofton get his degrees? Uh, for those of you who may not know, in order to form a lodge, a number of about 20 brethren have to petition Grand Lodge for dispensation. And the person who serves as a uh, first master of that lodge must be a past master. Uh, they must be eligible to, to serve as, as master of that lodge. And Joel Lofton, as well as the, the other brethren that were listed on that charter, they originally came from Belmont Lodge 108 in Faison, North Carolina, or sometimes it's listed as Bear Marsh, sometimes it's listed as Bowden. Um, it was kind of flexible. Um, but he served that lodge in or in 1845 or 43, I do believe. We'll find out in a minute. And then I also got a question about what's the, what's the story of the Sutherland Burnett House? We'll talk about that in a minute. And what other fraternities existed in Mount Olive? Because it wasn't just the, the lodge that existed in 1903. There were a couple of other organizations that existed in, in the early 1900s. Uh, so we'll talk about those as well. But let's. Dr. Benjamin Franklin Cobb, um, he was a medical doctor in the area. 
uh, around Warsaw is where he was originally from. And his mother was, or his father was Enoch Cobb, mother was Mary Sasser, and he attended Jefferson Medical College in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania from 1846 to 1847. He married Winifred Catherine Lofton, and he practiced medicine uh, in the northern division of Duplin County. In 1862, he, he passed the Confederate Army Board of Medical Examination, and he was uh, enrolled as a surgeon in the Confederate Army. And it, later on, it lists some of his dealings as a Confederate uh, Army surgeon, uh, serving at Fort St. Philip in Brunswick County near Wilmington, and uh, it goes on from there. Just his exploits during the uh, Civil War. And when he was finished with the Civil War, he uh, he was relieved from duty at Fort Castle in order to report to the officer in command of the 3rd Military District. And in March of 1865, he signed a statement of the President of P.C. Hayes, Lieutenant Colonel and Provost Marshal of the U.S. Army in Goldsboro, North Carolina, saying that I hereby solemnly take oath that I will not divulge to any anyone anything that may be known to me in regard to the Federal Army as strength, position, movements, or anything else connected with, with it, signed Benjamin F. Cobb, Surgeon, PACS, meaning that he would not divulge anything he knew about the Federal Army to any of the remaining resistance from the Confederate Army. Um, and he came into parole by the Provost Marshal at the U.S. Army in Gold Pearl. Now, he continued practicing medicine in Kingsville in, in 1870 with his wife, Winifred, and his nine children. Um, in 1874, he was practicing medicine in Wilmington. And then 1880, he moved to Hickory in Catawba County and was practicing medicine there. He picked up and moved along with his wife and nine children to, to Hickory, North Carolina. And then in 1887, he moved to Richmond, Virginia, intending to establish uh, medical practice there. However, just one year later in 1888, he died at his residence and the most likely cause that they were able to attribute to it was the paralysis related to a stroke. Uh, in 1891, his widow, Winifred, uh, lived at 1000 West Main, Richmond, Virginia. Look that address up now, you'll find out that it is the Virginia, Virginia Commonwealth University. Uh, so that's just a little bit of history about someone in our lodge who most likely brought our charter home but never became Master of the Lodge due to his service in the Civil War. So let's talk a little bit about the next question on that list. Where did Joel Lofton get his degrees? Well, I mentioned that Joel was a member of Belmont Lodge, uh, number 108, in uh, Faison or Bear Marsh or Bowden. Um, he lived in Calypso at the time, and, and he is actually buried in a family cemetery in Calypso. Um, that is where he, as well as the other members, original members of Mount Isle Lodge, came from. There were a few uh, members that show up in the early records of our lodge that came from a, another uh, lodge in Everettsville, North Carolina. Everettsville was just north of <coughs> present day Dutton. And it was a prominent community. They had their own train depot. They had their own post office. They had their own schoolhouse. They had their own Masonic Lodge. And the members there, well, they had enough money when they decided to move to Goldsboro instead of being in Everettsville, they picked up their house and took it with them. Um, and considering in the 1800s what type of an effort that was, that kind of tells you what type of people were staying there. Um, there are a couple of doctors that lived there. I think uh, Dr. Cobb may have lived there at some point, but I'm not sure, exactly sure on that. There were a couple of other doctors, a uh, McKenna's Tatum, Tatum, that might have lived there as well. Um, but uh, anyway, let's look at the, what was that, 
next question. Oh yes, uh, what's the story on the Sutherland Burnett House? Well, as I was reading through all the different rabbit holes that I was running down as I was doing this research, I ran across a little bit on the National Historic Register for the Sutherland Burnett House, which is just across the street from the old post office. Beautiful house. Um, and owned by a former member of our lodge. But uh, it was originally owned by uh, a Joseph Shine. Not that, maybe not the exact house. There was actually another house that was built there and then it was refurbished um, whenever uh, Joseph Shine's wife passed away and it, it passed on uh, property. But when I read the register, something kind of clicked in me. Uh, you know, as Masons, we're charged to do acts of charity, but we're also charged to um, make sure that we take care of the widows and orphans, and particularly to take care of the widows and orphans of our members, of our brothers. Um, and we are to you know, treat each other with respect. We're supposed to you know, aid each other when, we, when, when we're in need. And so I read this, and I'm going to read it for you. It says, when the childless Joseph Shine died in 1887, having no ears, he gave a life estate to his wife with reversion at her death to the children of R.J. Subtle. And I thought, hmm, why would you leave your house and property to somebody else's children? Didn't you have... Uh, maybe a brother or a nephew or a cousin or somebody that you could leave that property to. And it says, and it, this is a quotation from his will, R.J. Sutherland, my good and true friend, who has always and at all times acted as a brother towards me, assisted me in financial troubles on several occasions. The death of Carolyn C. Shine in 1914 ended the, night, or the 40 year residence of the Shine family. And in 1919, R.J. Sutherland Jr., Annie S. Wooten, and Katie S. Steele deeded their interest in the Shine property to their brother, Benjamin uh, W. Sutherland, with, who, with his wife, Julia McGee Sutherland, transformed the old residence. It was that word brother in that quotation that was a clue for me. And I started looking at the membership records. He acted like a brother because he was his brother. They were both members of, of my old lodge at the time. And that to me explains why you would leave your house and your property to the children of your brother. Having no heirs of his own, he did the next best thing. So how are we doing on time? <coughs> Seven o'clock? Okay, we're going to have some time for questions. One last thing I want to look at. What other fraternities existed in Mount Olive? Um, you may notice that uh, to my right here, there's a nice big picture frame, and it says Grand Lodge on it, but you may not be able to read the rest of it. It's actually the Grand Lodge of the International Order of Odd Fellows. It's not the Grand Lodge of Masons. Um, and the lodge met at that time in a location uh, at City Hall and uh, Fraternity Hall, along with a few other organizations. W.C. Steele was also a member of the, the Knights of Pythias, which was another organization that was uh, active in, in town for a small amount of time. But if you look at the, there are names listed on that charter. Uh, you'll see that the names on that charter are also listed in the membership records of Mount Olive Lodge. They were meeting in the same space that we were. We shared the same meeting location, and we shared many of the same members. It's just we met on different nights, and we had slightly different purposes. Pretty much the same, but it, it just slightly different. Um, but uh, that is just something that has been preserved by us uh, from them. That is, comes to the end of my uh, presentation. I want to talk to you a little bit about where the, the sources are. 
So the Grand Lodge website is where I started at, and that has on its website all of the annual Grand Lodge proceedings going back several hundred years, many of them digitized. So I was able to look through those records and do uh, searches on keywords like Mount Olive or 208 and uh, be able to identify different things that were going on in uh, our proceedings. Um, in some of the older proceedings, it actually has the annual report from the lodge, which shows the officers that were serving that year and also the other members of the lodge for that year. So you have a record of the total membership of that lodge for that year. So if you're interested in genealogy and want to see if some of your members of your family tree were members of Mount Isle Lodge, that's a good resource to go to. Um, now, the Grand Lodge digitized those uh, proceedings through the, uh, the next two that are listed, archive.org and digitalnc.org. Those are the two organizations that digitize those Grand Lodge proceedings for them. So uh, the links from Grand Lodge will send you to those next two uh, locations. But there are, are some other uh, materials at those locations outside of just the Grand Lodge proceedings that you might be able to find. This, uh, fourth one on that list is also East Carolina has its own digital collection and that was where I was able to find a few bits of information about Mount, uh, Belmont Lodge as well as a few uh, papers and letters about a member of our lodge by the name of Zach Cox. Um, that was an interesting read for me because he, he wrote home from China, where he was serving during World War II, to his wife, who was near Camp Lejeune at the time, uh, at the birth of her third child, who happened to go to school with my mother, um, I found out later. Uh, and he is writing to her, elated about uh, the news. He had just received the telegram. Um, and uh, was very happy to be able to collect on the bet that he had with some of his other uh, Marines at the dinner that night because they had all bet that it was going to be a boy and he won the bet. Uh, but uh, it had been a very enlightening and uh, educational and enjoyable effort for me to kind of learn more about the history of Mount Olive Lodge. And hopefully I've given you a few things that have been of interest to you. As I said earlier, this is an ongoing effort. It's something I'm not done yet. There's, there's still more digging to do, plenty of uh, material left to find. But uh, at this time, if I go open it up to questions. If, if anyone has any questions. On that graph you showed near the front, okay. and, and there's a certain place you stopped and said that, that it's declining, I think. Why is that you think? Why is it the membership decline? Right. Um, it's hard to say because membership is declining not just in Masonic lodges, it's declining in all civic organizations, whether it's the Lions Club, the Sibtons, uh, Kiwanis, JCs, Rotary. And I think it just has to do with culture changes. Um, and we have to change the way we present ourselves and market ourselves as being relevant to current times. Um, the Grand Master this year um, has as his theme a Masonic revival. And just like you would have a church revival, it's to reinvigorate the membership and to breathe new life into that organization, that church, or that civic organization, or in our case, to, to Masonry. Um, and that involves us doing things differently. If you do things the way you've always done them and expect different results, that's the definition of insanity. Uh, if you want different results, you have to do things differently. Did that answer your question? Any other questions? 
Well, I do have one other little thing that I need to uh, do uh, before I turn the microphone back over to the page. Uh, Mr. Dildo, do you mind coming up for just a minute? Because... Uh, I'm sure you would tell me why. <laughs> sure. uh, well, there's a door prize. Uh, so, uh, we realized that we have some bits of information, some bits of history that serve this community much better in your hands than in ours. To be locked away behind a closed door for hundreds of years does nobody any good. So um, this charter that belonged to the now extinct International Order of Odd Fellows, would you take charge of that? Our lodge voted uh, about a month or so ago that uh, that belongs more in a museum than it does in a cramped closet somewhere. So that's one thing that we want to present to you. But uh, there, I mentioned to you there was something else that um, we happened to discover that there was something about the banking history of Mount Olive. Um, there's the, the Bank of Mount Olive had uh, what are called counter checks, as well as the First National Bank of Mount Olive, and then Southern Bank and Trust Company of Mount Olive. So I figured between the three of those, you might be able to do a little bit of a display that relates to some of the financial institutions as it relates to, to Mount Olive as well. So thank you so much. You're welcome. We will cherish this for a long time. Take care of it. I, I will mention to you that uh, some of the names, we had actually talked about that earlier, that the, the names there also correspond to some of the names of the members of our lodge. Um, it's a little hard to read right now, but uh, hopefully we can find a way to brighten that up and make it more presentable. Thank you. Oh, yeah, question. The cornerstone that's on this building, is that what was on the other building? Yes. That, that is the original cornerstone that was laid in 1935 or placed at the original location, uh, which is now, I think, the DMV office. Uh, and uh, then it moved across the street to what was a, a bank building there. And then it moved to here when this um, library opened, or shortly thereafter. Um, and I still remember this as Belk Tyler's. Um, I remember going coming here with my mother and my grandmother. Um, but uh, it, the, the small library that I once walked down the street from my dad's barbershop to go visit um, to now what we, we have here has, has come a long way. And I'm very pleased to see just how much progress has been made in Mount Olive as far as library services. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? Just to note, uh, the Lodge is the first organization in Mount Olive in 1858, the only one that existed when the town was chartered in 1870. That, that's, so that's it has a special place in our history. Right. Yeah, we, along with a couple of churches, were some of the original institutions in the town of Mount Olive. Um, interesting little note well, about Belmont Lodge in 108, um, they used to be upstairs above the Presbyterian Church in uh, Faxon. Um, now Mount Olive, we met uh, what was First Citizen Bank, and then that burned down in 1905, I believe it was, or there was a location there, then there was a location at City Hall, and then we moved over to our current location on what used to be called Pearl Street, uh, but was renamed for uh, a member of our lodge, Pete Brazil, uh, who was also, I think, the first clerk of the Bank of Mount Olive. And, well, and we also had the head of the fire department, the head of the uh, ambulance police station. And several, if you look at Masons, and you may not see what we do as a lodge, but what we do individually as members of the community, that's where you will see masonry at work. That's uh, where we take our masonry and then make an individual effort to be 
active in other organizations, to be charitable with other organizations, and to serve our community in all different aspects.